Hello. Uh, thank you for joining the World Bank's Agriculture Finance Support Facility webinar. Today's topic is about including psychometric testing into credit risk assessment. Today's speakers join us from the Entrepreneurial Finance Lab. We welcome Amy Vaccaro and Julia Reichelstein. Our facilitator is Alberto Milan, Agriculture Specialist with the AgriFin Program. I'm Tamara Palmer and assisting with today's webinar. For those of you who have not participated in one of our webinars, uh, please allow me to provide a quick tour of the space. All participants are on mute. If you need to connect with the facilitator or tech team, please send your question through the chat box feature, which is found on the right side of your WebEx screen. The last 20 minutes of our time together will be a Q&A session with the presenters. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the webinar. We will collect and share them as time allows. This webinar is being recorded and all materials, including the recording, will be made available on the AgriFin website within 24 hours of today's date. And now, a quick introduction of today's speakers. Amy Vaccaro is the Product Marketing Manager at EFL North America. Amy has over 10 years of experience, including five plus in technology product marketing. She comes to EFL from change.org, where she was in charge of product positioning, go-to market strategy, pricing, content creation, and sales enablement for a global sales team serving thousands of global nonprofits. For change.org, she worked in product marketing at Salesforce, focused on the data.com business unit. She started her career in management consulting at Bain and Company. Julia Reichelstein is the digital lead at EFL Africa. Julia focuses on supporting and growing EFL's digital business. She moved to Nairobi, Kenya in 2015 to develop the SMS product for a key partner in East Africa. Taking the SMS psychometric test from concept to reality, she designed, implemented, and scaled the product. She has experience in human-centered design, product field testing, business development, and product management. Prior to ESL, Julia worked with the World Bank and the Millennium Ch Challenge Corporation. The Entrepreneurial Finance Lab, or EFL, provides credit scoring technology for banks in emerging markets to improve access to finance. EFL uses alternative data and innovative technology to power lending in the world's leading financial institutions. EFL's application collects and analyzes non-traditional information about borrowers to better forecast their likelihood of default. I'm going to turn it over now to Alberto, our facilitator, to uh, kick off today's official webinar. Alberto, are you with us? Yes. <clears throat> Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today for the including psychometric testing into great risk assessment webinar. We are really excited to have Amy and Julia here today and learn more about their work at the Entrepreneurial Finance Lab. Um, in recent everything webinars, we have seen a lot of interesting work on how FinTech can help rich clients who otherwise would be too remote, too costly, and not quite worth enough to access finance. Specifically, we have seen how big data analytics are used to create a score and how mobile technology and mobile money can enable transactions to move into the lower cost data space, turning previously excluded clients into potential attractive. Today, um, we are presenting EFL and the interesting and innovative work they are doing in this sphere with a very unique approach to create risk assessment by specifically focusing on psychometric testing, which has the potential to dramatically expand the potential of fintechs to increase financial inclusion, and specifically for smallholder rural populations. Amy and Julia will explain us today how psychometric testing in great risk assessment works, how by analyzing someone's motivations and behaviors, we can get an improved assessment of their propensity to repay loans. This could be a game changing, and we are lucky to have EFL come and talk about what they are doing, their case with Equity Bank Africa, and the potential for this kind of approach to reach rural agriculture clients who are financially excluded. Without further ado, Amy and Julie, thank you so much for joining us today. The floor is yours. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Tamara, and thank you, Alberto. Um, and thanks to everyone in the audience for joining us. We are super excited to be here and to share a bit about our work at EFL. So, as Tamara said, EFL is a leading alternative credit scoring company. We use psychometric and behavioral data to assess credit risk for lenders in emerging markets. Today, we'll be sharing a bit about our, our work using psychometrics on the feature phone with Equity Bank in Kenya and its implications for your institution's digital evolutions. 
So a quick overview of our plan for the next hour. I will be kicking it off. This is Amy, and I'll hand it off to my colleague, Julia Reichelstein, who is the brains behind our work, extending EFL's credit assessment over SMS in Africa. She'll walk us through a guide to where EFL works best, share a digital readiness primer, and then walk through our design process for reaching rural customers digitally, uh, and finish up with a case study of our work with Equity Bank. At the end, we'll have plenty of time for questions, so feel free to add your questions into the chat box, and we're excited to get to those at the end. So this slide is really the reason that we are here today. Globally, about 70% of people are not covered by credit bureau data, and this gets worse in certain emerging economies, as many of you all know. Um, we see this not only as a problem of financial inclusion, but it's also an opportunity for lenders. Uh, the reality is that many of the 3 billion people that are unbanked or underbanked are worthy of credit and worthy of lending. It's just that the information doesn't exist for lenders to know that. So quick kind of look at the evolution of, of credit scoring and how we've gone about solving this problem over time, we as a, a society. So um, back in the 90s, loans were generally given based on relationships um, between loan officers and people receiving the loans. Um, around the 2000s, credit scoring really um, started happening, but it only covered a small amount of people. Um, over time, lenders um, began equipping loan officers with new sources of info on borrowers, um, and today we're seeing more and more lenders move beyond the loan officer and actually make credit decisions digitally and without loan officers uh, using both traditional credit bureau data as well as alternative sources of data. So a quick little story about the founding of EFL. Uh, we were founded in 2006 out of the Harvard Kennedy School. Um, it was founded by a PhD student and his professor, and they were really looking at the problem of serving the unbanked to stimulate development in emerging markets. They tried a number of ideas uh, to figure out a way for how somebody could send the signal that they were um, credit worthy um, beyond having a credit history, and found that psychometrics, or the study of the differences in individual character, could indicate credit risk. Uh, everybody has a personality, and they realized we could use that as a data point in credit scoring, which is really the premise of EFL's whole business. So just kind of a quick look at the different data sources that are out there for use in credit scoring. Um, this chart is based on a study that we did at EFL. Um, when we think about different data sources, we look at two main things. So one is predictive power, and the other is availability. So as you can see here, bureau data is really the most predictive data source, but it's also highly limited in availability. Psychometric data, on the other hand, which is our bread and butter, is 100% available. So that means we can score anyone at any time, um, though predictive power is a bit lower than bureau data. And you can see we also look at mobile data, online data. We're always looking at other sources of data. Um, our goal is not to be a psychometric only company, but a company, an alternative credit scoring company that leverages all the different forms of data that are out there to help people access credit. So just kind of a, a recap um, about EFL. So we are a leading alternative credit scoring company. We've been around for 10 years. Um, we are really proud we've enabled over 1.5 billion in loans globally through the lenders that we work with. And we've built up a very strong track record working with financial institutions across Latin America, Asia, Africa, and Europe. Our psychometric and behavioral data science can be applied universally uh, to any prospect and online to help lenders say yes where they would have had to say no to more low information borrowers. And a quick look at how we do it. So um, an unscorable applicant for a loan at one of our partners will take the EFL assessment. They can take it on the web, on a mobile device, or over SMS, as we'll hear later from Julia. Um, it produces a three-digit score that our partner will use in making its lending decisions. So some of our partners use EFL as their primary source of credit data, and others use EFL in addition to existing data sources and scores um, to provide predictive lift. One thing to note, we really assess the applicant character and willingness to pay. Um, we work well with other tools, uh, like credit bureau data, that get at ability to repay. And over time, we've developed a data-driven understanding of what character traits contribute to risk based on real-world loan performance that we've seen over the 10 years that we've been doing this. Um, this chart here on the right 
um, will change from one population to another, but much of it is, is stable in terms of what traits are really predictive of risk. And if you're curious to see what our assessment, our credit assessment looks like, uh, and learn more about psychometrics, feel free to check out a product demo that's available on our website at eslglobal.com. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to my colleague, Julia, who will share more about where EFL works best. And uh, take it away, Julia. Perfect. Thanks, Amy. Um, hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Julia Reichelstein. I'm EFL's digital lead, um, as I was uh, introduced by, um, which means that I focus on all of our digital products um, at a global level. Um, and so digital, by that I mean kind of all of our products where someone is taking the test remotely. Um, so if that's on uh, over the web, if that's on a smartphone, or if that's on a feature phone, um, I'm really looking at how EFL can drive our work and scale and, and kind of the financial inclusion work that we do um, as financial institutions go digital um, and as a lot of the channels that people use to interact with their financial institutions are digital. Um, and so I wanted to kind of spend the first part of this webinar um, really looking at kind of where EFL has been shown to work best and the situations and the types of lenders um, where we've thrived in the past. Um, and then I want to also go into a bit of a, a kind of digital readiness primer. Um, so just kind of thinking about the context of financial institutions going digital and how alternative data um, credit assessment can fit into kind of that process and, and where it can fit in and how it can work best. And um, so I think that those first two sections are really kind of the overview. And then I'll kind of switch it around and kind of do a 180 and really then start from, from the very bottom and looking at human-centered design. Um, so as mentioned, I, I came to Kenya um, a couple of years ago and, and really started on building out an entirely new product for the feature phone. And so I'll kind of go into the weeds of how we built it with human-centered design, um, how we kind of designed that product, implemented it, scaled it, and then go into the, the results of it, which are the equity bank case study. Um, again, if you have any questions or any comments, feel free to put them in the chat um, and we can get to them at the end. So without further ado, um, I think, you know, the main, the main key takeaway that, that I have seen and I think that EFL has seen over the past couple of years is really that EFL works best with institutions that kind of have a clear, I'll call it a pain, kind of a clear challenge um, that they really kind of need um, not only credit scoring to, to help solve, but alternative credit scoring to help solve. Um, as Amy mentioned, you know, we were brought out of Harvard Kennedy School um, really to look at this problem of financial exclusion, um, but also kind of for that problem of, you know, someone comes in off the street to a bank and because the bank has no data on them, they're just kind of blindly sent away. Um, that's obviously uh, a negative for, for the customer who's potentially a good credit risk, but it's also a big um, you know, opportunity lost for the lender. Um, and so this kind of first, I'll call it a pain point, um, is really the one that we've seen that if the lender has this, then we can provide real value to that institution. Um, so if the, if the lender has kind of a low acceptance rate due to lack of data um, and, and high rejection rates kind of with thin file or gray zone clients, um, EFL, because we can score anyone over kind of any of these digital channels, we found um, we can provide kind of real value there. Um, and I think that's incredibly important, especially in the digital context when, as we've seen, when, when banks go digital, acceptance rates tend to go down. And so there's kind of even more of a, of a pain there. Um, at the end of the day, though, we are kind of, we are a credit score and, and we can be used, you know, just like kind of any other credit score um, that's, that's out there in the world. And so we are, you know, used in different contexts and in different situations. And so sometimes we are used kind of with lenders that see high levels of default. Um, and they, you know, bring us in to help cut out the, the you know, um, bottom X percent of borrowers, try to cut out, you know, that, that top level of default. Um, and then we're also used in some processes of actually trying to um, decrease the, the length of the loan application process. So some of our um, partners will bring the EFL test in at the beginning and um, use this as a way to sort um, kind of who to spend time on and who not to spend time on. Um, I think this one is actually particularly relevant in the non-digital context, so when there's still loan officers. So you can imagine, you know, someone taking a test at the, at the beginning, and because the, um, because the application process is pretty expensive for the lender, with field visits, with staff time, with loan officer time, um, they actually use EFL as a way to sort through 
kind of all the applicants and, and cut the cost and time of application. Um, and so at the, at, you know, at the end of the day, that's really kind of where, where our scores are, are working best. Um, again, that increasing the acceptance rate um, or decreasing the fault or, or kind of increasing operational efficiency. Um, and we can be used in combination. And so we do have, have cases where we see kind of a, a swap set um, use case where we're kind of not only increasing their acceptance rate, but, you know, we, we help them, you know, think about also who their kind of most risky clients are. So we can in some ways decrease their default rate and then also increase their acceptance rate, um, which is which is a really powerful tool for, for a lot of our partners. Um, and, and so I think from kind of that standpoint of really, you know, what pain is EFL trying to solve, then we can come in and say, okay, how can we build you kind of a custom solution um, and, and pick the right product and the right setup to, to have you see kind of success with the EFL tool? And just kind of an, a, another kind of primer on where we're successful and with which institutions. Um, I think that I've seen institutional readiness be, be a really large factor of success. Um, and so we've, you know, we've worked with a lot of partners kind of across the globe. As, as Amy mentioned, we're in Latin America. We're in Africa, we're in Asia, we're now in Europe as well. Um, and we've seen some partnerships thrive and we've seen some that, that haven't, haven't done as well. Um, and you know, we haven't kind of continued working together. And so when we think about where we've seen that success, um, I would really point, I guess, first and foremost to um, being credit score ready for the institution um, and having kind of significant volume. Um, so what I mean by kind of being credit score ready, it means that institution is um, positioned in a way that they are able to kind of actively take in and use a three-digit credit score um, and be able to set acceptance policies or to set um, operational policies or even if they're kind of more sophisticated, um, set, you know, um, risk-based pricing or, or set loan terms um, in accordance to a three-digit score, the ability to kind of take it in and really use it and use the cutoff. Um, EFL does kind of a quite a bit around consulting with our partners as well. So we don't just kind of give you a score and then, and then walk away, but we help quite a bit in terms of setting cutoffs, um, you know, with, okay, let's see what your target acceptance rate is, let's see what your target default rate is, then how can we make sure that, you know, the cutoff is working and right for you. Um, and then we also work a lot with, you know, actually adding in all these other data sources that the, the lender has that are potentially more traditional data sources. So we'll work with lenders to create a custom scorecard with our score and a bureau score um, or an internal behavioral score, or we'll even kind of come together and build an ensemble model, um, you know, for all these different scores for the, for the lender so that they're getting kind of maximum predictive power um, with EFL playing a role in that. Um, so kind of being credit score ready, I think, is, is first and foremost. Um, and then also I would say that, you know, kind of right underneath there is, is also high volume. Um, by high volume, it's, you know, it's always kind of a, a moving target, but I would say, especially in the digital world, high volume means that, you know, they are dispersing and receiving, you know, in the thousands, if not tens of thousands of, of credit applications per month. Um, we have seen kind of lower volume lenders, um, and we can still work, and I think that it's, 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 still, um, it's still feasible, but really, you know, the, the value add of credit scoring, um, especially um, you know, an EFL credit score is, is actually, um, it's, it's maximized when, when you have kind of a critical mass of volume. Because really at the end of the day, credit scoring is segmenting your population. And if your population is kind of too small, um, then we can see, you know, just from our pricing and from, you know, what we're contributing back to the partner, um, too low volumes actually is kind of a barrier to, to a thriving partnership. And then the other two, I'd say, um, are just kind of institutional mindset. Um, so kind of an ability for the institution to push forward um, uh, kind of across all levels. So, you know, we work, you know, across financial institutions. So we work in the risk department, we work with commercials, we work with the management team. So an ability for the motivated team to kind of really be willing to, um, you know, take in what is in some ways kind of a risky and an innovative solution and, you know, give it a chance and implement it and, and kind of are driven to really see it succeed. Um, and kind of in that lane, also having kind of a, this innovation mindset. Um, so a willingness to try a new sh solution and a willingness to, um, you know, have ESL come in and, and prove that we can work and are predictive and can kind of create value for that institution, um, which is kind of a, a risk. Um, 
but it's also kind of a, a mindset of, you know, moving towards the digital. And as I'll see in a second, um, you know, a lot of what EFL does these days is helping institutions actually take their first digital step or, you know, take another step towards becoming digital, digitized um, as, you know, as institutions go that direction. So really I would say that's kind of how we classify a, a really um, strong partnership and, and a partnership that um, we've seen to be successful. Um, now just to kind of go into, again, more macro digital readiness primer. Um, so I think overall uh, financial institutions are, are going global, are going digital globally, um, which is something that I'm sure everyone here um, who's, who's in a financial institution has kind of been beaten over the head with. Um, and it's been going on for a few years now, so I'm sorry to put another slide in front of your face that says exactly the same thing. Um, I know, you know, all of these conferences are about kind of going digital and what it means. Um, but I think, you know, at the end of the day, it, it is important. Um, and it's important, you know, for a lot of different reasons, but it's important for financial institutions kind of specifically just on their ability to scale and their ability to kind of um, cost effectively serve customers. And um, this is just one kind of data point. I know there's, there's a lot out there. And um, this is from McKinsey, and it's basically saying, you know, that across the board in um, financial services, um, when you go digital, when you digitize, you know, whatever aspect of the business it may be, um, you can kind of cut costs by 80 to 90 percent um, by, by digitizing. Um, so there's just tremendous cost savings to, to happen, and I think um, especially in the lending space. Um, so it doesn't say here explicitly, but in this transactions category, this kind of third bubble here, um, this is where they're kind of classifying all loans as well, so it's transactions and loans. Um, and this is saying that, you know, there's an ability to, to cut costs by 90 to 95 percent of, of, um, of being able to facilitate um, this, this type of transaction. Um, so there's definitely immense potential of going digital. And I think banks, you know, across the world are seeing that and then they say, okay, great. But, you know, what does that mean to go digital and, and how can I do it? And, um, you know, I can't do it in a day and I can't do it in a year probably. Um, it's going to take many years and it's take many parts of process. Um, and so I think at the end of the day, it's important for us to maybe understand, you know, what, what do we mean by going digital? Um, and, and a lot of banks ask, you know, us this and ask me this and say, you know, how, what have you seen other banks doing um, or other lenders doing? Um, and how, how can I kind of define it? And I think at the end of the day, I'm, I'm basically saying um, being digital means being scalable, that um, when you're digital, you can actually, you know, increase your, your scale and your volume and you can service more customers. Um, without adding on more staff, or I guess not, at least not in kind of a, a, a meaningful correlation there. Um, and so it's, a, and it's an ability to really kind of um, build up uh, your, your scale potential um, without, um, without, you know, adding more call centers and adding more loan officers and adding more people on the ground. Um, and, and I understand that kind of going digital, you know, it's, it's a lot of puzzle pieces that have to come together. Um, and so, you know, having a digital core banking system, you know, one that can take in, as, as we mentioned before, you know, a three-digit credit score and do something with it in real time, that's a puzzle piece. Um, but so are kind of all of the rest of uh, what lenders do, um, especially even just in, you know, this is just looking at the, the um, lending cycle. Um, so from customer acquisition to assessing affordability to assessing risk to doing identity checks to servicing to collections, each one of these puzzle pieces has to be kind of um, pushed along and helping to go digital. Um, and some are kind of more ripe, I think, for, for going digital than others. Um, I think we can see that, that risk is actually one of, has been highlighted as one that's kind of most able or, or most primed to be able to go digital um, because of kind of the wealth of data that, that exists now, kind of passively collected data, um, whether that's on social media, whether that's over telco data, um, and also just the amount of data that can be um, actively created, like the data that EFL built. Um, and so especially at volume, um, this, this kind of puzzle piece of risk and its ability to, um, you know, be digitized is actually a, a first step that a lot of lenders are taking in, in going digital. Um, I think that, you know, they're seeing that there's, or, or lenders are seeing that there's definitely challenges um, to this digital process. Um, I think, you know, no one, no one likes this reality, but I mean, I, I've seen, I think, you know, we at EFL, EFL have seen um, pretty standard increased risk 
when it comes to going digital. Um, you know, if someone is taking a loan, um, you know, from their computer, from their from their phone, and um, that's a really different dynamic than kind of having an in-person relationship with the loan officer. Um, and what I've seen kind of a, across the across the spectrum is that, um, you know, because of that, uh, default rates do go up when you go digital. Um, and so you've got this great cost savings, but you've also got this increased risk. Um, and that comes with both kind of uh, both fraud, um, but then also kind of just people um, not repaying their loans. Um, and, you know, we can kind of think about why that happens. Um, but I think, you know, one puzzle piece of it is that you lose that, that personal touch. Um, and so without that human interaction, without that loan officer relationship, um, you know, are you kind of, are you sacrificing you know, your ability to really connect with a borrower and to build kind of customer loyalty with your financial institution. Um, and then financial institutions say, okay, yes, probably. So how can we start to bring back some of that human-centered relationship um, and bring back kind of that really communication with the customer um, in a way that's both meaningful for the customer, but also potentially could help us with, um, you know, getting our, our default rates down and, and making sure we're controlling that risk. Um, and building customer loyalty. Um, and so at the end of the day, I think EFL is saying, you know, we can we can in some ways help be your, your digital loan officer um, in having that conversation, especially at the point of application. Um, you know, loan officers, they're, they're traditionally going out and getting that gut check on someone's risk and having those initial conversations. And EFL is, because we're assessing character and we're assessing willingness to repay, we're kind of saying we can, you know, play a role there and so when there's not a loan officer present, we can still, you know, in a standardized and, and scalable way and actually in an unbiased way, so kind of taking out the human bias element of it, um, we can ask kind of those key questions that we found to be, um, you know, statistically significant um, in predicting risk. Um, and so we're kind of this, this digital loan officer there. We can, and we can assess that risk kind of anywhere or over any device. Um, and we can do that, I think, in, in a lot of different contexts. Um, as as I kind of mentioned, you know, going digital, we we see as a process, um, and we do work with partners kind of across a lot of different stages of of their their digital transformation. Um, so whether that's a first step, um, where you know they're a traditional lender and they have no um, and no kind of digital presence as of as of yet, um, you know, we can be their their first foray into the digital world. Um, as an example, we, we worked with kind of the largest bank in, in uh, Ecuador, uh, Pachincha Bank, um, and, they had, and they had no kind of web channels, they had no mobile app channels, um, and they asked us, you know, how can we um, kind of effectively score and assess, you know, pre-qualify um, candidates who are, who are potentially better risk um, without going out and having loan officers test, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. And so from that, and that was back in 2013, which is when we started going digital, we built the first custom web assessment for them. We did a kind of mass um, email campaign and sent out you know, an email saying to all of their rejected customers um, who had been kind of just flat out rejected because they didn't have enough data on these customers at the time. And we sent out this email and, and said, you know, come take this test um, you know, from your own web browser, from your own computer or smartphone. Um, and then from there, we can kind of qualify um, qualify the applicant. So we took those in and we provided Pachincha back um, a list of, of candidates. Um, and now that EFL tool, that EFL web tool, is still very much a part of their process. Um, you know, they were able to accept, you know, hundreds of thousands of people because of that first screening. And so they saw the value there and they saw the value of going digital. And so then, you know, over time, they've built their own web channel and have EFL kind of integrated into their online process. Um, so in that way, it can kind of be used as a, as a tool for customer acquisition um, and also as a tool for reject recovery. Um, but then, you know, we see a lot of partners kind of in this middle stage, I'll call it walking, um, where they have these, have these hybrid models um, where, you know, I call it the, the digital mullet, um, where in the front end they have a, you know, a, a digital channel. So they have a, an app where they have a, um, you know, they have a, a website. Um, where people can apply, but in the back end, it's still fairly manual, and you still have staff looking through applications. You still have call centers calling people to follow up on applications, um, and so it's kind of half digital, half not. Um, and and here we can really see that you know EFL can can combine in that way as well, um, either integrating into the app, into the online channel, and and potentially helping to 
not only you know increase acceptance rate or decrease default, but also that operational efficiency use case where because they're still having this um, manual backend, um, you know, kind of helping them understand which customers to kind of fast track um, or which customers to spend kind of the resources on upfront or to not spend the resources on helps them a lot in, in kind of weeding through the, the boom in applications that they're getting from going digital and having this kind of hybrid model. Um, and then kind of lastly, you know, we see some clients like actually the one I'll talk about Equity Bank here in a minute, um, that they are running in, in digital, that they kind of have this fully digitized process, which means that they have a digital um, core banking system and they make real time decisions on credit applications. So they get credit applications through um, an, an equity bank, it's mobile, but it could be online, and they get it through a digital source. Um, and then, you know, they are scoring and analyzing data on that application in real time and producing a decision and, and disbursement um, all in real time as well. Um, and so that is the case that, that, you know, I think a lot of institutions are kind of running towards. It's very hard to get there. Um, but in that case, you know, I think EFL can really flourish in, in what we can do, which is, um, in, in this case especially, I think it's, you know, increasing acceptance rates and helping the lender, you know, see, okay, in real time you're, you know, you're dispersing potentially or accepting only, uh, you know, 10% or 20% of all your applicants. How can we get that percentage up? while uh, making sure that we're kind of stabilizing default in your portfolio, so you're not taking on an um, additional risk. Yeah, Julia, may I interrupt you for just a second? Um, quick question, do you have other case studies um, from your work in other countries that uh, participants can, can review? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so they are all on our website. Um, so if you go to, to eflglobal.com, uh, there's a ton of case studies there. Um, and, and they kind of look at, yeah, all of these different use cases um, with different lenders across the world um, and on different channels as well. Um, so if you're interested, you can, you can go to the website and, and there's kind of a wealth there. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, so I think that, you know, that kind of sums up my, my macro thoughts on, on where EFL works best and kind of how we work in the digital process. And now I'm going to, as I said, kind of really transition and go into the weeds of it. Um, and so this is going to be a kind of a bit of a 180. Um, but it's really kind of me, I guess, sharing my journey here that I've had in Kenya um, uh, with, the, with the design process for, for this feature phone application um, and then kind of looking at the results of it. Um, so I think that, um, you know, I, I came to Kenya in 2000, early 2015 um, with a challenge to build a feature phone version of um, our assessment. And so what Amy described earlier, you know, our assessment is usually on, um, on a tablet, on a web application, on a smartphone. It has images, it has games, it has exercises. And we look at, you know, a wealth of data in, um, in what's coming in, you know, both not just on kind of the psychometric content itself, so what someone is, is answering about, um, you know, their, their opinions, their view of themselves and their community. We ask about budgeting. We ask about, you know, food intelligence. Uh, we ask about, um, you know, all sorts of things on optimism and honesty and locus of control. I mean, there's, there's just, you know, a ton of categories that, that we're getting data on. Um, so in the psychometric content and then also on the metadata, right? So how someone is interacting with the test, um, how they're clicking through it. Are they going, you know, back and forth? Are they changing their answers? How long does it take for them to answer certain questions versus others? Um, so we're seeing a lot, just a wealth of data in those traditional channels. And then, um, you know, we, we had a, an engagement with Equity Bank um, here in Kenya, and Equity Bank is one of the largest lenders in the region. Um, and they had acquired an MVNO, Equitel at the time, um, and they were kind of keen to start doing mobile lending. And um, so that's lending where, you know, someone literally just has a feature phone or it could be a smartphone. Kind of more likely than not, it's a feature phone and they can on their, you know, SDK, uh, USSD menu, go in and, and request a loan. Um, and they request this loan and, and as kind of we saw before, uh, equity is, is kind of running at digital. So they request a loan and in real time, they're assessing the credit risk, they're assessing the application and then they're dispersing. Um, and so they really wanted to expand this product, but they wanted to have um, EFL come in and, and, you know, do a test that was able, um, someone was able to take the assessment actually over their feature phone. 
And so my, my uh, challenge here was to uh, design a, an SMS version of the test, and a version of the test where we still had strong predictive power, um, but we got none of those games, none of those exercises, none of that metadata, um, and really had to kind of start from scratch on, on thinking about how someone could, um, you know, take, take an EFL test just over, just over SMS. Um, and so from there, it kind of led me down. I have a, a background in human-centered design, so um, I just wanted to kind of share with you guys kind of my process of designing this, um, this product um, for, for Equity Bank. Um, so I think when we do human-centered design, kind of the first step is, is understanding our bones. And I'll call that really just the framework of what are you working in? Uh, what do you have kind of no control over? Um, in terms of, you know, what you need to be aware of and, and, and where you can build your product in. Um, and so understanding that, I think, is, is always the first step. Um, so what do I knew? I knew that it was a, an SMS product, a feature phone product, which means that it was all text. <laughs> um, no games, no exercises, no images, no sounds, nothing like that for me. Um, and so it had to be text heavy, um, which is, uh, you know, as, as I'll talk about, is, is in some ways really difficult then when you have low literacy um, populations, and so that can always be a challenge. And um, I also knew that kind of with question length, um, it, it's 160 characters per SMS, and that had to contain, you know, both the question and the answer key. So what I mean by that is that when we do an SMS test, um, or what I wanted to create with an SMS test was really a conversation. So I wanted it to be kind of a seamless way that someone was, you know, uh, they get the first test and it says, you know, some, some intro to this is a survey to help equity understand you better as an applicant. Um, you know, are you interested in taking this test? And they say yes. Okay, great. And then it starts. And then the first question comes in. And in that first question, it has to be not only the question, but also has to be kind of the answer key. So it has to present, you know, what that person will, um, what present to that person kind of a framework of how they should answer. So if that's, you know, do you agree or disagree? Uh, is that like uh, one, two, three in terms of, you know, out of t on a scale of 10, how much do you agree? Um, and then kind of making sure that they understand uh, how to answer back. Um, so I think that was kind of the key um, parts of, of the framework. There's also some, some things that I've witnessed here and um, when I did field testing originally was, was mistrust of the product. Um, so there's a lot of kind of SMS scams going around um, in Kenya. And so people really need to trust that it was Equity Bank and it was kind of a, a, a legitimate service. Um, and also that um, I think the, the framework had to say, okay, they, these are open answer responses and SMS, people can type back anything. So how do we create um, a conversation and create a product that is both predictive, um, but also kind of is able to uh, take in those responses no matter what they are and kind of keep going in a, in a way that's, um, easy from a UX perspective for the customer, but also make sure that we get the predictive power that we need from, from the test itself. Um, and then I think also uh, coming in fairly to, to understand the customers, um, you know, we, we have to design for um, kind of maybe not the lowest common denominator, but a low common denominator um, in terms of, you know, trying to uh, maximize the number of people who can uh, successfully and enjoyably take an EFL test um, and, uh, and kind of go forward uh, through, um, you know, making sure that they have a test and, and they can understand it. So that's with literacy, understanding it, and also being kind of technology and, and having that connectivity to take the test. Um, and so that's really what, what kind of framework there was. And so I wanted something that was easy to understand and that was predictive obviously and um, within kind of the framework of it uh, that was forgiving if someone kind of didn't understand a question or didn't have kind of the, the way to respond that they needed um, and it was also building trust um, and at the end of the day we still had kind of all of our core traits of uh, content and predictive, uh, but we kind of focused in on, on what we really needed here um, and then kind of go maybe just a, a high level in the design process because I think maybe this is less interesting um, but really what we did is, is intense field observation. I spent probably six months sitting in a lot of markets in Nairobi and out of Nairobi um, and, uh, and you know, really just asking people questions. Um, then we did some pretty kind of strong experimental designs um, where we kind of swapped in and out different versions of questions and different versions of flows. 
Um, and then we kind of got a ton of data out of that and then did a, you know, did a big chunk of data analysis to make sure we kind of got to, to a best test. Um, so I think, you know, in this first step, what we really did is, as I said, kind of get out, get out of your, get out of your office. Um, or for me, you know, get out of the base um, and you know, do a lot of testing here. Um, and uh, so we were kind of watching how people interacted with their phones. We were kind of understanding how, you know, someone in a normal context uh, would would interact with similar products, um, competitive products, and, and then also kind of building pretty fast and easy prototypes. Um, and so, you know, we spent a lot of time just sitting down and saying, hey, like, can I text you some questions and seeing how they responded. Um, and so we were getting some real-time feedback there. Um, and then we asked them to kind of, without kind of providing too much, we asked them to, to explain back to us what do you think this means. Um, hey, Julia. Um, that, we wait, excuse me for interrupting. Data, as I said, so we, um, Julia, can you hear in me? In person. Hello, yeah. Julia? Hi, sorry, I was just going to say, um, we're, we're getting close to the portion of the, of the presentation where we'd like to open up the Q&A, so, um, I, I was hoping we could maybe leave, leave some of these slides um, for now and then uh, jump ahead a bit to um, get into a little bit more of the psychometric aspect of this design and then um, talk about the EFL case study results and then we'll open up for the Q&A. Is that, is that all right? Yeah, uh oh. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there we go. Okay. Sorry, um, I was cutting out. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um. Yeah. So maybe I'll I'll leave kind of this um and just go through it at a at a really high level and um, maybe we can share these slides afterwards. Um. So kind of creating the right data, exploring that data, and understanding you know, what makes the the right data, what makes the product good, um, and then doing kind of an analysis. Now that basically the 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 point line here is that we developed kind of this final SMS product where we're really trying to maximize predictive power by focusing on core traits and and, and really through ensuring understandability and building trust with the customer. And so I won't go into the details here, um, but hopefully um, we can share these slides afterwards on, on kind of if, if you're interested in, in what it meant to kind of build the product. And um, so then I'll Kind of go quickly into to the um, equity bank case study. Um, so I already kind of I think outlined the challenge here. The challenge really was can we create a predictive credit scoring product, product that someone can take over their future phone? Um, and the results I'm kind of, kind of happy to say uh, is, is yes <laughs> to that question. Um, there are kind of two main in designing this, and and this is actually just what I presented to you guys. And um, designing this uh, was Really trying to validate kind of a, a high conversion rate. So I think this goes to the understandability of it. So was someone able to uh, take the test and, and could we limit drop off? Because in the digital world, drop off is kind of a, a major uh, pain point, I think, uh, where people will kind of leave a test or leave an application. So that, that points to the UX of the SMS test. Um, and then also making sure that it's predictive and at the psychometric content and we could we were able to build a kind of a predictive model on it. And, and so from that we kind of took took all this in and, and ran this full pilot um with with equity bank. Um, I'm going to kind of skip over some of this, um, but it, it, the results of it were really that um, um, we were able to, to build the predictive model. Um, and so within a period of about four months, Months, three to four months, um, we, we completed almost 25,000 
um, Um, and so from this, the, the kind of the, uh, the framework of, of the test uh, was about 20 questions that someone was taking conversation style and we we saw um you know, Julia we saw, um we're, we're only catching about every other word right now um please yeah. just test your your headphones and make and sure they're well connected the ability for us to I think that's better. Yeah, this is Amy. Hi, Amy. Is can we? I can hear you. I think the rest of the participants can. I, I think we may have um, lost a, a strong connection for Julia's sound. Okay. I think I might. Yeah, yeah. we can hear you now much better. Thank you. Okay. So oh, I, I don't know if I kind of need to to go back and reiterate, but I think the punchline was uh, low drop off rates and uh, um, as kind of a strong predictive power um, just stand alone. Um, and so then then that's kind of the 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 kind of end of the story here of building this product. And the last kind of just point I wanted to make was on our ability to use that score um, and actually combine it with um, other types of um, scores. Uh, that, that equity had. Um, so we were able to, when we combined it with their internal behavioral score, which is just their transactional score, kind of their traditional data on one of their um, borrowers on, you know, their um, their transactions within the bank, um, we were able to say, okay, with the EFL score, you could actually increase your acceptance rate by 20% um, without taking on additional risk. So stabilizing uh, default, you could actually accept 20 more percent, uh, adding in the EFL score. And then similarly, uh, we saw that you know the traditional bureau here in Kenya is is pretty new, and that it wasn't quite working so well in predictive power for Equity Bank. And so we saw that when we actually brought in the EFL score on top of the bureau score, um, you know we could actually increase acceptance rates by 53% um, without um, Equity Bank taking on additional risk. Um, so at the end of the day, we're we're saying you know we EFL uh, we were predictive in this in this product for them. Um, and we saw kind of a successful UX for them. Um, but we were also finding different bad people and different good people than their traditional data sources, which at the end of the day is really what we need to, to show um, to show value, right? It's not enough to just be predictive. We have to kind of add additional predictive lift on top of, um, on top of their traditional sources. Um, so we're able to do that and, and, uh, and move forward there. So I'm going to stop. I know I've just talked for over half an hour and over my time. Um, so maybe we can can transition back to, to Q&A. Thank you very much, uh, Julia, for this really interesting and uh, insightful presentation and on the innovative work that you guys are doing. Uh, we'd like to quickly ask you a few questions that we had regarding your presentation and also that uh, the audience was raising. So one thing would be, uh, what is the, for those financial institutions that are interested to move into this space, what is the evidence base of scientific testing when making lending decisions? What is the way that this can contribute to a wider scorecard or credit scoring? Yeah. So, sorry, is the question then um, how do we kind of assess the value that we provide? Exactly. If a financial institution was interested to get into or expand these services, start using the services, uh, what would be the added? What is the evidence that using psychometric testing for making lending yeah. decisions could actually increase and improve credit scoring? Yeah, definitely. Um, so one thing I love about about credit scoring is that it's actually you know quite uh, quite straightforward to assess. Um, I guess how well your model is predicting. So we use I think pretty standard industry metrics on area under curve or, or Gini coefficient on, to understand how predictive we are. 
Um, but again, kind of that's not enough. And so then what we come in is we also say, you know, we, um, you know, we not only are predictive, but we're, you know, adding predictive lift of X amount to whatever um, scoring that institution is already using. Um, and it varies on customers. You know, every, every partner that we've worked with sees different results um, in terms of the added predictive lift, in terms of the value that we're creating. And it depends on the use case, I think, of, you know, are we there to increase your acceptance rate? Are we there to cut out your default? Are we there to, you know, do operational efficiency? Um, but uh, I think across the board, we've seen that, you know, we, we can be predictive and add kind of predictive lift to get at the goals of whatever that specific institution is, is trying to do with kind of this alternative credit score. Okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you so much for that. And um, how do you assess the the gap between the potential gap, basically, between willingness to pay uh, from a client and at the cost of default relative to the ability to pay? Yeah. Um, so I think traditionally we've said, you know, EFL really comes in on on willingness to repay, um, and we do a little bit on on ability. Um, because especially with our kind of business tests, um, we do look at kind of um, some things that you might um, see correlated to um, business success in your business. So we look at kind of business acumen and budgeting and fluid intelligence. And we've seen that that sometimes is linked to how kind of successful the entrepreneur is in their business. And then, of course, that also gets that affordability. Um, but at the main point, we, we really look at willingness. Um, and I would say that, you know, willingness at the end of the day should be one puzzle piece in, in a broader one. Um, we don't kind of encourage our customers to, to only use the willingness part because obviously affordability and kind of all of these other checks are, are quite important. Um, in terms of kind of assessing what percent of predictive power comes from willingness to repay versus ability to repay, um, I might say that, uh, you know, it's, I would say that, you know, it really depends on, on context as well and on the type of product. Um, I think that, you know, with larger loans, um, so with uh, like SME loans um, or, or um, kind of larger even retail loans, that, that affordability comes kind of more into play there. Um, and then when you have kind of smaller, potentially more digital loans, like the ones at Equity, these kind of nano loans, and then I see that willingness to repay is actually a much, um, much stronger part of the puzzle because, you know, assessing someone's affordability to repay a $15 loan, and um, that's actually, you know, most people can repay a $15 loan. Looking at their income statements isn't going to tell you that. It's really more of, okay, if you text someone somewhere $15, do they have the character, do they have the willingness to repay you? Um, so I think it kind of depends on that context as well. Okay, excellent. Thanks so much for clarifying this answer. Uh, how how would you do or how do you go about uh, addressing those market segments where literacy rates might not be as high, like in rural areas or agricultural clients in more remote locations? What mm. is there any other mechanism or opportunity to use, still use psychometrics or how do you go about it? Yeah. So I think our kind of actually our traditional product was was quite good on that. And so the traditional one is is with a loan officer, um, and and we see this with, with really kind of low literacy clients, and um, sometimes that's the best option. And um, so we kind of have a tablet test, and the loan officer will sit there with them and, and basically read aloud the test and, and help them through it. Um, and we've kind of created um, pretty robust metrics around making sure that, you know, the loan officer is not gaming the system, and there's kind of no cheating involved. And so in that way, kind of even a low literacy, no literacy um, person can, can take the test. Um, but I think that, you know, as it goes digital, we are very much focused on that. It's actually something I'm, I'm working on now um, with saying, okay, we really want to go digital even with uh, low literacy clients. How could we maybe do that through like IVR, um, right? So like a phone call um, where someone can just uh, either press a button on their phone or, or actually just have, a, have an actual phone conversation and, and have us be able to get kind of scalable uh, data or um, and, and kind of quality data out of it, um, such as through like potentially like natural language processing. Um, but I think we're still a bit a ways away of that, but it's definitely something on our, our R&D roadmap. 
Okay, it's great to hear that. Uh, just for the purpose of agri-thin and the nature of its work, like what is the potential of the actual use in the agricultural space? And how do you see this approach being able to fill gaps where no other uh, relevant data exists? Yeah. Yes, we actually work with um, Chihudi Kilimano here in, in Kenya, um, and I work with them here in Nairobi specifically. Um, and they are a, an agricultural lender, um, one, of, one of the largest in Kenya. Um, and they use us um, for kind of really that, just that key use case of trying to increase their acceptance rates. Um, they've seen kind of a, an, an inability to be able to um, kind of accept the people that they, that they want to accept because they're, they're just seeing too high default rates. So they needed a way to, to gather more data on, on their applicants um, at kind of time of application. Um, so we're definitely seeing some, some good traction there and some good success there. Um, I would say that, though, obviously with agricultural loans, it is, you know, it is, especially in this context, um, psychometrics is one piece of that puzzle. Um, and so, you know, what I hear a lot and what I see and what makes a lot of sense is that, um, you know, with agricultural lending, the, the macro um, phenomena that happens, whether that's a, a drought or if that's violence in the region or if that's a pest or whatever it is, um, you know, that can make a bigger difference on repayment than, um, kind of the individual level, um, the individual level kind of uh, risk, um, and so I think in that case um, we're kind of we're working with Jihudi and, and we work maybe with other agricultural lenders as well to think about how they can bring in EFL as just another puzzle piece and integrate it with other alternative data information maybe on uh, those macro shocks as well. So you can try and get as as complete of a picture as possible. It's great to hear it and encouraging uh, that yeah you guys are also moving into the agri space and exploring this this arena. Uh, just one last question before we wrap up. Uh, when you start using the algorithm to sort out potential clients, how do you ensure or support financial institutions to ensure that they are compliant with customer protection laws and treating customer friendly principles? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, I know it's a, it's a big topic in alternative credit scoring these days. Um, so I'd say that kind of first and foremost, uh, EFL I think is well positioned there because we are, as I said, like actively creating this data. So it's not kind of a sense of we need someone's permission to access their social media or we need someone's permission to access certain records that have already kind of passively been collected. Um, but someone actually really knows, you know, they're taking this test and so uh, they, they kind of, they know that we're going to be using that for um, for credit risk assessment. And we work with our partners to make sure that the test is kind of framed correctly so that, you know, the customer knows this is something to be taken seriously and this is something that will affect their ability to get a loan. Um, so, so we work on kind of framing the test that way in the application. Um, and then we also do kind of all of the, the due, digital, due diligence on the back end of kind of encrypting certain information before we pass along to, you know, our servers and to score it. Um, so we make sure that we don't have any kind of personal identifiable information um, sitting along with kind of the test record in our systems, um, just just for security day. Okay, brilliant. Uh, thank you so much, both of you, for joining us today and for saying the work that ETL is doing. We've seen a lot of colleagues in the audience that are really interested in your work, and then we'd like to hear more uh, about what you do on the presentation. So we will be sharing details on your presentation and once again, thank you so much. I pass the floor to Tamara so she can wrap up. All right, thanks, Alberto. Um, we've had a lot of great questions coming in today. And excuse me for that break in the connection. We've had a lot of great questions that have come in today. Um, didn't quite get to all of them. Um, hopefully, Amy and Julia will be able to work with me after the webinar to sort of refine a, a, a list of question and answers that we will include with the webinar materials that you'll receive today. You will receive the webinar recording. You'll receive the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, so we'll follow up with you on that. But uh, thanks again for joining you. Um, a big thanks to Amy and Julia for presenting today and getting into the, the nitty gritty details of this type of technical system for FinTech. Um, this, this information will be available on the website within 24 hours. We will then send all of the information to our participants. We invite you to join the conversation by joining the Agriculture Finance Group on LinkedIn, 
where we post materials and have conversations about these webinars. And I uh, also wanted to put in a quick mention about our upcoming forum. Uh, it's going to be Financing Low Carbon Resilient Agriculture taking place in London, September 12 through 13. Uh, that is going to be coming up soon, and registration will be opening soon as well. More information is available on our website. Thank you again today. Um, Amy and Julia, thank you so much. Thank you. Great to be here. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Have a good day. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.